Hi everyone um, and welcome to this uh, cooperation uh, live online event um, on fan-owned football clubs. Uh, my name's Eva Murray and I'm the new campaigns officer um, at the Cooperative Party um, and I'll be your chair for tonight. Um, it's my first time chairing one of these uh, co-op lives so, so please be kind and, and nice. Uh, co-op lives pro provide the opportunity for our members to come along um, and have a discussion about the issues and campaigns that we are passionate about um, at the Cooperative Party and um, hearing directly from those involved at the heart of those um, issues. Um, I'm really pleased to welcome you this evening but before I introduce the speakers um, I just wanted to kick off with a little bit of um, housekeeping um, and a few tips on how we can make it um, as interactive and as comfortable uh, for everyone taking part. Um, so firstly for those of you who may be hard of hearing uh, you can enable captioning by pressing the CC icon on the bottom tools panel um, of your phone or computer on the Zoom app. Um, this Zoom call is being recorded and many of our members cannot access it live, so we will make it available to view via the Co-op Party's uh, YouTube channel afterwards. So if you don't want your image to be seen, remove yourself from the video and just go to um, audio only. Um, you have been muted to make the content of this call clearer about, and pre by preventing interruptions in any background noise. Um, only those speaking will have sound enabled and when it is your turn to speak, uh, we will send you a mes message asking you uh, to unmute. Um, after we've heard from today's speakers, we will hold a question and answer session and there are two ways you can ask a question. Either raise your virtual hand by pressing the hand icon on the Zoom um, app um, or post it in the chat box facility um, if you're not keen on contributing live um, I'm happy to ask your question uh, to our speakers and we'll try and get through as many questions um, and contributions um, as possible. Um, and finally, just before we start, um, I just want to emphasise that the Cooperative Party believes that our cooperative values should be reflected in our actions as well as our policies. We want all members um, and all our event participants to feel safe, welcome and respected in our party. So please ensure you abide by this when making your contributions today. Um, and I really look forward to, to hearing them and having this uh, wider discussion. Um, and now just to introduce this evening's discussion, um, the Cooperative Party knows how vital football clubs are to their communities. Um, as our national game, they bring people together from every background, united by a passion for their team. Despite this, over recent years, the game has increasingly felt more distant from the communities they were set up to serve. Even between the leagues, the vast wealth of the Premier League clubs has increased the gulf between those at the top and those further down the football pyramid. And um, At the Co-op Party, we have long championed fan ownership in football. We believe that every club fa fans should be provided with the chance to gain a financial stake in their club and a real say in the way it is governed with a presence on boards the ability to appoint and remove directors and the right to purchase shares football clubs are at the heart of communities up and down this country and we can't sit by and watch them be dislocated from the people and places that love them so this week uh, we, know, we saw the government finally move to put improvements to football governments into law um, and to discuss these developments um, and need to go further towards fan ownership i'm delighted to, to introduce um, our speakers for tonight um, so our first speaker is is niall cooper um, he, niall is the ceo of fair game so over to you niall Eva, it's a uh, pleasure to be here and we've uh, obviously had great support from the co-op party over the last a couple of years. The uh, King's Speech was a really welcome development and um, we have been obviously calling for independent regulation to football for a long time. But what, what really needs to happen? What, what, are, what does it mean? Um, it does mean that we're looking towards having more security and proper owners and directors of our clubs. But what really needs to be the change is really looking at the financial flow and how much that level of money that goes into the top end of the game and making sure it secures the future for clubs lower down the pyramid. But what does that mean about the clubs lower down the pyramid? For us, it's about rewarding the well-run clubs, those community clubs, those clubs that really want to be sustainable. And to be sustainable actually really ties in with the co-op ethos because it's about investing in your community. It's about making your football club what it always used to be, which is a hub within your area, within your own community, you know, a place where a destination's point, but also a club that invests in the infrastructure and the uh, way that the clubs actually run. And also one that puts things like fan ownership and financial sustainability and community engagement right at the heart of their own ethos. Now that, a few years ago would have seen almost an impossible dream. But I think now we're on the cusp of doing that. And I think this is where co-op members can really take their chance and really push forward on that agenda and look at the bill that's coming forward and try to make sure those amendments come in. So what does that mean in terms of what you can do? I think when you look at it, 
it's about having that fairer financial flow based on well-run clubs and a well-run club is something that fair game has been looking into for a long time we have what's called a fair game index and you can find it on our website uh, fairgameuk.org and that rates every single club on 80 touch points across four key criteria which are good governance financial sustainability community engagement and fan engagement and it's about making sure that clubs can thrive in the future clubs like as we will hear from tonight derby and luton and making sure that they have that community ethos right at the heart and that clubs don't do and don't have the kind of reckless owner that has this kind of trait which is unfortunately far too common of spending more on players wages than the club actually earns because if that goes wrong then we've got the Rams Trust on tonight and they will be, undoubtedly be able to tell you an awful lot about that. We've got a lot of time and energy for the Rams Trust and I think the work they're doing to try and change the way that club's run um, is really fundamentally important. Um, and the other club that's on board tonight, and I have kind of feel like I'm introducing them both, but I think they're both fantastic people, is Marianne from the Luton Town Supports Trust. Now, Luton are one of those clubs that have had an ethos throughout their entire existence of being well run. And if there's a club that football should really look up to over the last few years it is Luton they've gone on such a journey to get to where they are and with the right ethos and so this kind of myth that all football clubs are bad is, is wrong you know you can champion good clubs and that's basically what fair game has always tried to do is bring the value driven kind of the clubs that you know have the, that co-op ethos right at their whole core and to try and make sure that those are the clubs that are, are celebrated and are well run and we change that culture and um, we're doing loads of research into a whole range of areas to try and find out what what is well run and to help those clubs so we're, we're doing things like what does a female friendly football club look like you know that's one of the big key areas of research uh, how do you embed environmental sustainability how do you embed good governance we've just done a good governance consultation what does ethics look like what does a real owners and directors test look like I, I race through all of these things but these things are all fundamentally important to changing the way football is run and, and with the regulator that door for the first time is actually open because football hasn't fixed itself for an awful long time. And this is an opportunity for those with a more holistic oversight to look at how football can fix itself and, and actually make a real fundamental difference, which is why I think having supporters at the heart of that and the community clubs, the ones who put community first at the heart of it, is so very, very, very important. I realise I've now waffled on and, and, and there are some brilliant other speakers. So I'll stop there and I'll, I'll really look forward to having uh, being quizzed in depth about it all later on. But um that's kind of where we are with fair game and, and what our mission is to try and make a difference. Thanks very much for that um, introduction. And now um, I think it's all probably already started. There are a lot of people thinking about questions to ask you, I think, especially around, um, you know, future proofing clubs. Um, and also what you mentioned at the end there about how we, you create a more inclusive um, club and the environmental impacts, which I know a lot of football clubs are becoming more and more conscious of, but how do you take that further? Um, but like you also did say there are blueprints on how it can be done well um, and the good practice. And I'm delighted that um, you, Marianne Broadbent from um, Luton uh, Town Supporters Trust is with us tonight. So I'll pass over to, to Marianne. Hello. Hi. Um, really nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, I, I grew up in Luton. I'm a passionate Luton Town fan. I went to my first match when I was six uh, with my dad and uh, he was a season ticket holder for 51 years and I now have his seat. So for me, life would be very different if Luton still uh, didn't still exist. Um, I have got involved now. I'm on the board of the Supporters Trust. Um, we were one of the only trusts to present to um, Tracy Crouch. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the Luton story, which is how come. So it's a testament, really, I think, to 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 Luton and Luton fans that we're still around um and uh through that got to meet Niall and and very proud that 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 Luton Town is now a member of Fair Game and I sit on the advisory advisory committee advisory council with Niall um just in terms of uh the trust and our role I suppose going looking forwards and I really feel for you, Eva, because we were, were, you know, like we've had our bad times and we have survived. So I feel for your moment. Um, we have at the moment four key priorities and strategies. Um, protect and support the club. Uh, obviously engage and grow our membership. Um, professionalise the trust and the way we interact with, with the authorities and with, um, with the club. Um, and representing, obviously, the, the voice of the fans. Um, 
we do have a good relationship with the club. Um, but if I just step back a little bit, uh, Luton is one of the oldest football teams in the country. We were inaugurated in 1885. Um, and it is fair to say that we've had our ups and downs um, and primarily due to bad owners. Um, I'm not going to say anything about the FA. Um, <laughs> uh, we're here to to talk about fan-owned fan football, I suppose. Um, and I have to say, Luton, we were absolutely saved from disaster and from just disappearing um, from this succession of bad owners. And we were saved by the fans. Um, we They created a trust. Uh, they called it Trust in Luton, I think, in, in uh, 2003. That evolved into the Luton Town Supporters Trust a little bit later. Um, and those, a group, a consortium of those fans went on to buy the club. Um, so 2020 developments is they are fans of Luton Town they've all been fans all their life um, they care a lot about the fact they talk about being custodians of the club you know they're not the owners of the club they are the custodians of the club that is keeping the club there for, for, for the community um, we if I go back nine years we were because of various points deductions and, and bad owners and debt and et cetera, et cetera. Um, we were playing in non-league football. And in the last nine years, no, no little due to 2020 developments, we've just gone from strength to strength. There's a beautiful chart. <laughs> As a fan, you would just want to look at going up and up and up. And this year we were promoted to the Premier League. Um, that could be the end of our story. Um, we hope not, but let's <laughs> let's let's see. Uh, but uh, holding our own at the moment. Um, I think there are a number of different ways of fan ownership, and we're lucky in that we've got 2020 development. Um, we work very closely with them. So as the Supporters Trust, for example, we, well, I mean, not least matches and meeting them for drinks before matches. Um, but things like every time they have a board meeting, we have an after the board meeting with them, with the trust that just says where they share the finances. They talk to us about the challenges. Uh, obviously, we talk about the football and performance. Um and they are helping us. We've done a number of things to put protection in place and they're helping us because they recognize that they might not always be around and they want to make sure these mechanisms are in place. So we have uh, a number of shares in the club. Um, we have the image rights. So we have signed off image rights, which means that the, um, the club cannot change the color, the name. They can't move us out of Luton. Um, we sign off the strip every year um etc so so we have some protections there um the sort of things that you don't necessarily think of as important until someone tries to change them and then suddenly it's like whoa you know i mean well look at the super league i mean that was a bit of a disaster wasn't that last year um if i talk a little bit about community because i do think that what you what you said in the uh in the um uh, introductions about sort of football clubs being vital to their communities and I mean that is true you know there yes there are a small number of the Premier League largely teams where they've got fans from everywhere but everywhere else it's the heart of the community and Luton is a very diverse community um, so football is one of the ways we can bring all the different factions together and have them work together um, we have a lot of youth development so we are bringing you know we haven't got big budgets as Niall said we've tried really hard to manage our club um, I say that as if I did something I did not. Um, but the kind of, you know, the the we've tried really hard to, to manage the finances, which means we have to develop our own talent and then sell them on in order to to, to fund what we're doing. Um, we've and in fact, the trust, we are we're responsible for solid, which is the supporters of Luton. Um, youth development so we do a lot of fundraising for them etc um, we have a community trust we work very closely with um, they create opportunities for children for for sport and, and football um, you know there's lots and lots of initiatives under there to making sure kids have got football boots making sure kids have got school lunches um, interactive sessions with the police to try and break down those barriers between teenage kids and, uh, and the police um, we've got over 50s football um, we have something that I'm never quite sure I've got the name right, and I always call it, I think it's the Fat Club, 
um, but it's sort of aimed at men, getting men to come in to have discussions uh, uh, about dietary, but then go out and do some exercise and the sort of thing that, you know, mostly they don't want to talk about. But when it's the football club, you can do these things, you know, it's uh, and all of that has been very, very successful. Um, and I think uh, just to end really on the just kind of what we've got is a really exciting opportunity because we're building a new stadium. Um, and that new stadium, I don't know how many of you know Luton, you probably know the image of Luton, certainly the airport, um, but the, the Luton's actually quite a nice place. It's got great sports facilities, it's got good schools, it's got lovely countryside, it's got great transportation, but it's really, the town centre is, is just awful. Um, and what I think the genius move of the football club to choose to put the, um, put the new stadium at Power Court right in the centre of Luton, so it's between it's going to be between the shopping center next to the station and next to the parish church and it's going to have bars and restaurants and it's going to be part of the community and the club has done a super job of working with the council and the church and the and the local communities to make sure that that could really regenerate Luton which is just a magnificent opportunity um so very, very happy to be here and potted history of Luton's story, but it might, we might not have been here. It was not very long ago before we might not have been there. So we're delighted to, at the moment, have a very positive story. Thanks for that, Marianne. I think um, anyone who's who's seen Luton uh, recently will know like that rise that you mentioned is is quite phenomenal. Um, to get to get back into the the Premier League is is quite phenomenal. And I think you also hit on the the importance of of, of community, not just um, you know, people who are you see it as more of a more than a club. It's more like a family, more like the the wider community, but also the thinking about that wider regeneration of a local area and the impact that a football club um can have on on that side. So thanks very much for your contribution I'm, I'm sure that uh, a few people have have some more questions around that side of it so um, our next speaker is Elaine Dean um, Elaine is a board member on Central England Co-op but also uh, Derby County Supporters uh, Club Rams Trust so uh, Elaine over to yourself. Thank you um, so yes my background is really in the cooperative movement um, and uh, that's how I despite I am a football fan season ticket holder and um i was asked to chair the initial meeting to see if it was uh, required to have a supporters trust at derby um to see if there was an appetite for it um uh, because of my experience of chairing cooperative meetings so i i, I went along i thought this was going to be a one-off um and here i am 21 years later I'm um, still on the board of Rams Trust, but this is going to be my last year and I'll explain why later. Um, and, and I'm president of um, Central England uh, Society. I'm also chair of the local cooperative party. So my, my background is co-op and, and politics, really. I'm chair of Derby North Labour Party, too. So it's all been sort of rolled into one. Um, so the, the trust was formed um, and the co-op bank then um, in 2002, 2003, sold Derby County for three pound to two people, uh, three people who no one had ever heard of before, led by a barrister from Leeds who we'd never heard of. Um, and they bought the club. Now, you know, time went on um, and it was clear that, that these guys were not what they were purporting to be. Uh, and Rams Trust did a huge investigation into these people and a lot of the things that were going on, um, along with local newspaper editor, um, editor of news and sport at Radio Derby and various other people, produced a, a huge document um, which was handed over to the police and to the local press and all did a big expose helped by David Conn at The Guardian um, and there was a huge uh, there were arrests were made as a result of this the the leading people did go to prison um not the uh, barrister from leeds it turned out he'd been duped all along and um had been put in front you know at the front and given free seats and fed at every match to front these basically criminals that that were milking derby county so off they went to prison um, then there was a lot of lobbying of the bank to sell to a local consortium and Rams Trust campaigned fantastically. It's the co-op bank. So I had quite a lot to do with, with that, the campaigning and um, 
we the bank did sell to a local consortium. Consortium ran it quite well, but then um, I think they all fell out. It, it became quite difficult. There was five or six of them. Um, and then they sold out to some Americans. And then this went on until it went into the hands of a, a local uh, millionaire, Mel Morris. Uh, and until a couple of years ago, Mel Morris was the owner of the club. All went fantastic at first. He was giving away scarves. He was giving away flags. He was, it, everything was was wonderful. And you couldn't say a word. And, you know, if you were in the trust and you, you ventured to ask questions on about his uh, intentions, um, you know, you were ridiculed and piled on on social media and so on. It became quite difficult. Um, eventually, of course, he bankrupted the club, as, as everybody knows. And Derby County, um, two years ago, was in huge danger of going out of business. Um, now, one of the things that we'd done um, as a trust was put um, asset of community value onto the stadium, uh, which quite a lot of other trusts have done. But we also put one on the training ground, uh, which was a separate um, place. In, in, in an, under a different council as well. So we got one under Derby City Council, Pride Park, and, and the training ground under Erewash District Council. Um, and that, that proved to be a good move because when administrators were bought in, of course, they had to consult with the trust um, who'd taken the, uh, out the ACV. Uh, so we were in right on day one with the administrators um, hearing what was going on. Um, and then it, it just got worse and worse and worse. We were lobbying MPs. We've got lots of uh, worked cross party with MPs. Margaret Beckett was fantastic. Um, and it, it ended up, we, we didn't think we were going to get anywhere. I spoke with Tracy Crouch. Um, it just looked as though Derby was going to have to give up, disintegrate and start again at the bottom of the league. That's how it seemed. <laughs> Oh, we had a we had a chancer from America came who 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 was going to buy us in Bitcoin. Now he, he's since been arrested and he's facing a load of about as many federal charges as Donald Trump, I think, at the moment. Um, but um, that was very unfortunate that um, some fans had really been taken in with this guy with his private jet and and his private yacht and, and his private everything else, which all turned out to be on lease and various things anyway he bit the dust and out of um, um, that seemed like that really was the end um came forward a local philanthropist um multi-millionaire who owned um some of uh, a lot of property in derby uh he was a british midlands pilot uh, who'd inherited his father's business. Now, his father was what was in a consortium who wanted to buy the club back in 2005, along with um, former director Stuart Webb. And uh, uh, that, that wasn't the successful consortium. Um, it went to the Peter Gadsby Consortium. But uh, this um, he, he was called Charles Clowes, the father. He died and, and left his son this business, which he doesn't want to, to run, I don't think. I think he's put people in to run it. Uh, apparently flying is his passion. But he, sit, he sat up in the stand. He doesn't like sitting in the director's box. He really wanted to keep his own seat. He goes on the train to away games with the other fans and he's, he's the owner of the club. And he bought the stadium off Mel Morris. He bought everything. Um, and I, 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 it's almost like a fairy story. Uh, the first thing he did was he said he wanted to implement uh, Tracy, Tracy Crouch's um, recommendations. And um, we've been having meetings um, and a, a supporters board is going to be set up, which will have considerable powers. Um, a lot of the things will be to prevent what happened to, to Wimbledon um, happening. You know, you're not going to be able to move the club so far. You're not going to be able to uh, change the colours of the club as the, the guy did at Cardiff, didn't he? I think uh, changed the substantially changed the name. I think it happened at Hull. Um, so all those things are going to be handed over to the fans. There will be another another sort of board um, as like for a match day experience um, to, to discuss um, things around the ground, not concerned with governance. Supporters board will be concerned uh, with the governance. Rams Trust will have a definite seat on it. Um, 
Now, with all this um, uh, concerns over and, and uncertainties over the last um, 18 months to two years, quite a lot of new people joined the trust. A lot of new people joined the, the supporters trust, which um, was absolutely fantastic. And from that, have stepped forward quite a lot of people who are really um, have really got the right ethics and share cooperative values and principles. So um, I've been sort of re receding a bit and and letting these people take the front line now um, and letting them be the chair and and all the rest of it, all the things that we done all over the years a few of us um and i'm i'm quite satisfied now i feel like i've been a custodian of the trust and um that i will be handing this over to some younger people who share the values and principles the next generation of cooperators and they're going to take the trust forward so that so far that is a happy ending to what's been like 20 years of uncertainty at derby up and down up and down uh we're in league one we don't care. You know, we're just glad we've got a club. Um, and what will happen, I don't know. I don't know if we'll be promoted, but it's certainly nice to be in League One and be secure uh, with a, an owner who is a fan of the club um, and who isn't, a, you know, a rich Saudi or somebody like that. He's a genuine local person. And I'm always suspicious, but I have to say, he seems to me like a true philanthropist. I don't see any um, anything to be suspicious about. Um, so at the moment, that's all good. But it's certainly been um, a long haul from when we first formed the trust. Um, and I had to say, when I first when I first went onto the board of supporters direct, uh, yes, I, I, I went on the board of supporters direct, elected by um, members of supporters trusts all over the country. I was on there ten years altogether. Um, the, the chair of supporters direct at that time was Andy Burnham. Andy Burnham has never forgotten his origins. Whenever we go to anything and Andy Burnham's talking about supporters trust, he always knows his stuff. He's still there and he's never forgotten um, the people that, that came up with him. And he's never forgotten his friends that he made back in the supporters trust days. Um, I think that's probably all from me. Um, you know, I'm just happy to be here. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Elaine. I think it perfectly encapsulates your contribution there, the persistence of of supporters to, to not give up on on a club, and also um what you were saying there about trying to think creatively about when you when when things weren't looking good about using the ACVs to protect um assets, and obviously as you you mentioned how important that that was um in in the journey of of the club, but also I think what you touched on there, like you had um we've seen it time and time again in in British football, especially recently, um Americans. And, and other international millionaires coming in and with no real connection to a club just trying to acquire them almost like a like a hobby um but like you say a, a philanthropist came in he's a millionaire but an important thing was he knew about the club he's a fan of the club and um had that connection a real passion for the club and I think that's what we we all kind of strive for as, as football fans as as someone who understands um our our, our football clubs and um, so thanks very much to all three of you for your um, introductions and your um, initial um, initial contributions and um, I'll now open the floor so if, like I said at the start if you want to make a, a live contribution please just raise your hand um, or if you want to if you're more comfortable putting it into the chat uh, just type it in there and I'm more than happy to, to read it out to our guests and if it if your contribution is is, is, is aimed at one of our speakers and um, and please say who who you wanted that directed to so um, do I see any Oh, I see Rod Rodney Sad. I'll um I think if he just there you go, Rodney, you should be unmuted now. Yeah, I'm unmuted, am I? Yeah, good evening, all um previous speakers, yeah, very interesting. Um I'm one of those match day volunteers. I look after the hospitality suite at Stamford AFC in Lincolnshire. We've just got promotion. Um we run a good supporters share scheme. Um, but what does the group think of um, like bigger, rich clubs adopting smaller clubs? It's just an idea of mine that, you know, where the funding probably could be cascaded down to smaller clubs, like, like an adoption scheme. That's um, I see, I see, anyway. Thanks for that, Rodney. I see Niall's um, unmuted. I'll bring Niall in first. Oh, cheers, Rodney. Um, 
there's a little bit of me that's skeptical about that, uh, about having a, a club taking over a smaller club. What I do think is necessary is when you do talk about the the wealth within the game, and it is um, huge, and we're talking five billion pounds a year, which is over twice the nearest nearest other league, which I think is La Liga. Um, that amount really should be cascaded down the pyramid in a much fairer way. At the moment, um, the vast proportion of that stays in the Premier League over uh, over 80%. Um, and then within that, 80% goes to, of the remainder, 80% goes to the Championship, 12% to League One, 8% to League Two, nothing to the National League, nothing to grassroots, nothing to women's football. And that's clearly uh, a disproportionate way of how football should go. When you think about the last European Championship final for the men's team, 10 of that starting 11 came from National League academies. So obviously there is a sense about what you could do. And, and um, I would want to see significant investment and redistribution of that wealth further down the pyramid in a much more equitable way. But based on going to well-run clubs like Rodney, it sounds like your club's a well-run club and probably could benefit from having some more of that finances there. Uh, I mean, we are talking huge, huge sums of money. Um you know, if you were to, and then there's also parachute payments. So a parachute payment, um, one parachute payment is actually more than all the clubs in League One, League Two, the National League, National League North, National League South, the women's game, and the rest of the non-league get put together. One club getting more than, what, 144, if not more clubs. So there's a whole issue about the unfairness within football. Uh, and the people who've been tasked by the Conservative Party to fix it are the football authorities, so are the Premier League and the EFL. And the EFL voting structure is weighted heavily towards the championship. 50% of the votes of the EFL go to championship clubs. So the likelihood of that changing by being agreed by the football authorities is pretty small. Um, but by regulator with holistic oversight of how football's finances actually are, could be really transformational. Um, and I think that's where you could look at it. If you did financial flow based on how well run a football club is, then the ability to change that culture and to mean that clubs don't have the kind of gambling things as, as Elaine saw at, at Derby. And I know, Marion, you guys are in the, the lovely world of the Premier League now, but, you know, certainly there were, there were plenty of rogue owners in your history that that, um, that have done that. So it shouldn't be, you know, we do need to look at a very, very holistic oversight about restructuring the whole way football's finances are operating. And as a movement, we'd be remiss not to. Uh, I think that's where we really need to be brave and say, right, OK, well, there is a ch opportunity here for this regulator and it shouldn't have some sort of very narrow focus just based purely on whether a, an owner has gone bankrupt or whatever. You know, there's so much more significant things we can do. Um, you know, I think that's really fundamentally important. That's that for me is the big thing, Rodney, that could make a huge difference there. Marianne, I see you come up from mute. Do you want to? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought it was a great question, Rodney. It's not something that actually made me sit up and think, um, which is, yeah, I thought a great question. Um, I guess there's two areas that, that you could look at in terms of um, what that would bring. And obviously, there's the money side, there's also the support side. And, and I agree with, completely agree with Niall in terms of we have to change the financing of football. And my concern of doing this sort of uh, any sort of formal adoption scheme would be that it becomes another tick box exercise where people use it as an excuse not to do the the bigger thing um so oh but we're doing this and we're doing this and we're doing this so you don't need to you know we don't need to do the bigger thing um but i love the idea of having that sort of informal collaboration around support and ideas and you know for another local team so i think that's an, an area that could be very interesting elaine do you want to come in on that Uh, um, like Marianne, I'm not um, really sort of given any thought to that. It's a, it's a really good question. I think we've always been, since I've been involved, so desperately trying to keep our own club. Uh, we haven't thought about uh, any else. If it, if it became a national scheme to do that, then yes. Um, and there are um, local clubs that we do have connections with, um, but it's not anything I've, I've really thought about in the past it's been we've been too busy in survival mode ourselves. Thanks for that question, Rodney. It's definitely given um I think our panel something to, to think about. Um I've got Saxon um next. 
think that should be you now, Saxon. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm unusual here because I'm not a football fan, but I am um, a member of our Exeter City, which became a cooperative about 14, 15 years ago when the usual financial problems happened. And I support... I give them a monthly donation because they do such a lot of work in the community. They work with children, they run a s academy, um, and also they've been particularly active in the kick-out racism, which I think is a very important aspect of football. So I do think we ought to encourage cooperative party members to get involved with their local clubs if they are a cooperative. I think you've touched on something really important there, Saxon, that you know you don't have to be the biggest football fan to get involved and appreciate the the additional work that a lot of these these clubs that do in, in, in the community. Um I see Elaine's wanting to come in on that so I'll bring Elaine in. Okay. Yeah um yeah I'm pleased you were uh, mentioned Exit City because um I I served with um Neil Lemillier from their trust board for many years on Supporters Direct um, and uh, the work that they did. They are one of the successful community clubs um, and they, they've just quietly got on with things. Um, and I've always admired them. They, you know, they've been sort of uh, they've never hit the heights like Luton have done, um, come through and, and got back into the premiership. But the, but they've gone along and they run um what I would call is a very ethical club. As you say, they do a lot in the community and they do a lot of anti-racist work, which is really, really important. And I think we've all seen how important that is uh, recently. So, um, yeah, big good shout out for Exeter City. I always look for their results. So uh, keep going there, Saxon. All the Grecians. And they, the Grecians. They, they, in fact, in 1914, fought, um Made the first international match against Brazil, <laughs> which is well. an interesting <laughs> history. Um, but um, I, I do think it's important that we we encourage, as a cooperative party, people to get involved um, because it is it's appalling that such an important part of community life is dominated by millionaires from other countries who probably don't give a damn for what happens in our communities. Does anyone else want to come in on, on that question there? Okay. okay, well, thank you very much for that question, Saxon. I think it's really important to highlight and we see the additional um, the additional things that football clubs do in the community and, and the, the bigger campaigns that they are such a, a strong, strong voice on, like um, uh, Kick It Out, um, the, the anti-racism um, uh, campaign. Um, I've got Sue next. That should be you, Sue. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so you probably guessed I'm from one of those Premier League clubs. Um, just to say that we are extremely pleased that the independent regulator of English football is coming in. Um, the owners and directors test, I think, will be extremely useful and a useful tool to try and protect all the clubs because we've also had some real ropey owners, the Icelandic lot mainly. Um, and it's just so important. I just want to echo what one of the earlier speakers said about losing your home stadium. It actually just rips the heart and soul out of the club. So I also gave evidence to Tracy Crouch um, around the loss of the bowling ground um, because we're, we're now not in a football stadium. Anyway, one of the things that the West Ham Trust is we're working on is try to build inclusivity um, at West Ham, particularly given that the, the, well, I thought it was disgusting and disgraceful, um, the right wing effort on Saturday, um, where West Ham was one of the teams, I'm ashamed to say, that was noted to be in attendance at that group. So I'm interested in hearing um, around um, how to build inclusivity. We've got, we're trying to get a women's supporters subgroup up and running, and we're looking to run um, an event to build. Um, 
membership within the South Asian community, because obviously based in Newham, would quite uh, that tends to be um, a lot of that area, but not represented at the London Stadium. So I'm interested in hearing ideas around building inclusivity in particular, please. Thank you. So I could I really want to talk about this for a long time. Um, very very uh, intrigued and, and, and I think it's fundamentally important. One of the things that was really disappointing about the government's white paper on the independent regulator was the loss of equality standards. Mm. It was absolutely central to what Tracy Crouch put forward in the original fan review, having spoken to supporters groups up and down the country. She said that equality standards needs to be at the heart of all of the uh, implementations of what she was trying to do. That has been quite explicitly removed since. Um, and fair game, we're really keen to see that being put back in. Um, and I think for an amendment stage, that would be an absolutely fundamental thing to, to include. Um, what we're working on is, is two quite significant things in the area that you're talking about, Sue. Before I go on to my previous role on a different trust, um, it is... Uh, female friendly football clubs so that's basically creating a handbook about how do you create a female friendly football ground um, and that well football club and it's not just about the fans but it's also about your marketing it's about your staffing it's about calling out sexism at all levels mm -hmm. um, and you know actually trying to think completely differently um, I was on the board of a football club until quite recently I was a, I'm an AFC Wimbledon fan I was an elected member of the Don's Trust board I spent uh, two years uh, in many a boardroom and many of a boardroom unfortunately remarkably similar in colour and age as as I am uh, who have uh, very very outdated views and my my very strong view is that the way you're going to change that is by incentivizing clubs to behave differently um, you know we've had penalties and we've talked about uh, lip service towards equality standards and until it's linked towards a financial benefit I don't. I am sceptical about the clubs are actually going to make those big changes. Um, we've had conversations with lots of civil servants and DCMS, and they kind of buy into it. If you want culture change, and that's what we want here, Sue, um, you need to incentivise it. You need to actually make it financially beneficial. And I'll go back to the amount of money that's in the game. If you start saying, right, the clubs that are well run, and I include very heavily in this equality standards in that, then that's where you start to see the change. Um, there are many other like local little things that, that you can do in terms of trying to reach out and do that. I mean, you, you'll probably be aware of uh, Bradford City and is it the Bantham, I can't remember what they're called, the Bengali Banthams? Yeah. yeah, who are absolutely fantastic in this area. So I'm sure you're aware of those. Um, and I think copying a lot of what they do. I mean, that's the other thing about football is that we need to put aside a lot of the kind of rivalries. We can all be rivals for like 180 minutes a season. But the rest of the time, we need to look at where we can benefit. You know, we are communities. We are all different communities and we can learn from the experience of Luton, the experience of Derby, the experience of West Ham, and in my case, the experience of Wimbledon, um, you know, about what you do to really try and embed that community spirit. And I think there's so much we can learn. Uh, and I think we, we have to embrace that and we have to have a regulation and, and a, a party that puts that right at the heart of their kind of thinking. Because uh, it needs to empower it. You know, what Supporters Direct used to do was phenomenal amount of work that they did. And I was really proud of all that sort of stuff. And like Elaine, I, I'm Andy Burnham. I've spoken to Andy Burnham a few times and he's brilliant for this. And it's that kind of reinventing that is so important because um, I'd want to put that at the heart of all of that. I'm sure uh, Marianne and, and Elaine probably have more uh, kind of uh, actual proper practical solutions. But for me, Sue, I, I really go back to it needs to be the heart of the regulator. Uh, we can't be having lip service anymore. I, I found it so disappointing. I know Tracy Crouch did as well that it was taken out because it's just it was fundamentally the wrong move and it, it sent out really wrong messages. I felt within football. Marianne, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, I I immediately jumped on my unmute uh, when you were saying uh, when you asked your question because I thought it was a great one and your reference to the march um, it reminded me actually that you'd asked us to give some actions and one of my actions um, just I suppose my actions were write to your MP to stress that the regulator must have teeth 
um and to we i think we should add this whole equality thing to to it to make sure the inclusiveness is you know maybe that they need to do it right if the regulator is going to have power um i think making sure that your mp is aware of aware of fair game and the work that nile and the team have been doing to change football and i do think that the financial thing is really really important and is it, it football clubs you know for some football clubs they need the money and therefore they will do it for the money some are doing it already it's recognition and some are not but there has to be some sort of incentive and then what fair game will be trying to do is trying to help them to implement all of that but my third action was very much what what you were just saying about the kind of what can we do to change the image of football because I was incensed when the reporting of that march on Saturday was talking about right wing EDF and football hooligans mm -hmm. I was absolutely incensed at that because and then I noticed on the next couple of news reports it had disappeared because obviously somebody had but but I hate the image that football has because of a few people and what, you know, I know it's not quite your inclusivity question, it's more exclusivity, can we get them out of football? Um, but, you know, it's kind of focusing on the community aspects of it that, that show the good in football and how it brings people together from whichever background that they're from um, is, is a really good way to try and... Th rebalance that and push out the people who who cause us problems who are a very small number but somehow get way more airtime than they should so sorry for my soapbox elaine do you want to come in on the inclusivity no okay uh, thanks very much sue for that um question um i've got a couple of hands up still and i've got a couple um, of questions in the chat i, I realize we're running out of time so i'm going to try and get through as many um as possible i've got chris with his hand up yeah hi everyone so my question is about the fan ownership in other sports like rugby like cricket we've spoken a lot about football but i'm more interested also in how it impacts uh, other sports, if any of the panelists knows about it as well. Thank you. Um, support, supporters Direct had um trust set up for rugby, um, and I believe there was some attempt to get, I don't know whether that's still continued now, um, some trust set up for ice hockey. Um, it's also worth knowing that quite a lot of the county cricket clubs are cooperatives. Um, people are quite surprised to learn that, but quite a lot of county cricket clubs are cooperatives. So the the you know this does spill into other sports as well. I I don't know a great deal about that. That's about the sum total of my knowledge of it. So, but uh, you know, there will be people who know it. Maybe not people on this panel, but there will be people who know at um, the Football Supporters Association. Yeah, just to um, add to that, Elaine, I mean, uh, I'm from Fair Game. We get, a, we've had quite a number of requests for us to expand our remit and look at other sports because um, there are similar issues. Um, I mean, rugby is probably the more uh, obvious example than cricket because there are clubs that are going bust and they are facing very similar financial disparities. Um, uh, Marianne does sit on our advisory council and undoubtedly she quite clearly told me to keep my focus on football for the moment but um, you know there is there is uh, uh, talk and has been about expanding and looking at that um, uh, admittedly it's probably going to be in other nations rather than England uh, as the next one and either your Scottish accent I can tell you there's definitely quite a lot of Scottish conversations going on um, but yeah I mean I think there is a need um, that's really obvious uh, it, it's about creating that uh, organisation to set it up and to do it properly. And that's actually quite hard. Um, you know, I, I speak from quite a bit of experience about that, about how you can do it. But I think there is a need for a proper campaigning stuff. And, and in a way, the co-op party could help um, in that uh, in that uh, in that journey. Um, thanks for that question, Chris. And uh, you mentioned that my Scottish accent. There's been some real uh, success stories, obviously, in fan worship in Scotland. And I've got um, actually Eddie Thorne uh, with his hand up next. So I'll bring in, bring in Eddie. Thanks, Eva. And good evening, everyone. Uh, 
we play football in Scotland here, uh, so it's all been England so far. I'm a supporter of uh, Heart of Midlothian Football Club here in Edinburgh, and uh, we are a long, long established club, one of the oldest clubs here in Scotland. We had a Lithuanian owner, and uh, he basically took the club into administration. And it was thanks to the, the hard work of Ian Murray, who's currently the only Labour MP in Scotland. And uh, Ian's a, a great guy, and he was instrumental in bringing things together, which saved the club. And he brought on board a lady called Anne Budge, who's a, a, a multimillionaire here in Edinburgh. And she, she acquired the club, and then it moved from there to a foundation. And uh, we are now a fan-owned, but not a fan-controlled club. And there's a prominent Edinburgh lawyer who was one of the initial directors, and I approached him and said, we're a foundation, why did you not go for the cooperative model? To which he responded, well, we never thought about that. And I think there is an issue, uh, and this is something I've, maybe Elaine, Elaine, I'm sure Elaine will hear me rambling on about this. It's all about education. And it's all about letting people know what a cooperative can do. And, you know, in certain areas, people don't understand what a cooperative, a cooperative is. Uh, so we are a fan, as I say, we're fan owned, but not fan controlled. The foundation can elect two directors to the board of five but the other three were not uh, put forward by the uh, by the, the by the, the members of the foundation if i could turn to rodney's point uh, brighton and hove albion I, I think they're trying to establish a relationship with a club here in scotland but there's a legal issue there's an issue it's, it requires the football authorities to agree to that that's all for me Thanks, Eva. Who wants to come in on that one first? No, Elaine? <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I Elaine, don't mind. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Eddie. Um, Eddie, of course, is a director of the Scott Mid Cooperative Society. Um, and uh, I can tell you, Eddie, I've met someone at the same event you were at uh, last April who I think would be an ideal regulator for football and that's Gordon Brown I think he'd be absolutely fantastic um they, they wouldn't mess around with him that's for sure so uh good call Eddie hey would you want to come in on that I'll just say Eddie if you can get hearts to become a fair game club I'm in Scotland and we'd love it so we're starting that conversation. So if you've got any networks up there, then then get in touch. Um, we're speaking to um, Supporters Direct Scotland quite a bit about it at the moment. So, yeah, Eddie, doors open. You know where I am. Perfect. Um, thanks very much for that, um, Eddie. I thought it was important, as I know uh, your history with, with Hearts, uh, to, to come in there. Um, I think we've got time for just one of the written questions um, in the chat, if that's okay. It comes from Callie um, Harrison. Um, it says, how are board members currently appointed? Does it tend to be businessmen? Um, all, all other people, examples, athletes, etc., are also considered, would like to know. Clubs at all levels, just out of your experience, how is it? how is it been that board members are appointed? Oh, it's mates and mates. It's awful, Eva, is, is the answer to that. Um, the owners and directors test is a complete mess. Um, it is about as transparent as a brick wall. Um, it's uh, how those decisions are made. Nobody really knows. There is there is it is written down, but you don't actually have any kind of written judgment. Um, so that's kind of like how they happen. And it, it is often people tapping people on the shoulder there is very little transparency in far too many clubs um I, I am going to mention tracy crouch tracy crouch i was in a meeting with her uh radio conversation with uh gillingham football club and gillingham football club are, are not a good example of a football club just putting it out there um i'm now going to get probably into all sorts of trouble with the recording but okay um um and she was kind of to great glee in saying that she's going to fix the owners and directors test and that no longer can you have uh, appoint your own mates as a director 
And that's what she was hoping that the new owners and directors test will do. It isn't transparent. It is all about who you know. It isn't very inclusive. The, the lack of equality is, is shocking. Uh, there are a few exceptions. Um, I, I actually had a really uh, great time at Brentford really recently, and that was a club that was probably the most welcome, inclusive club I've been into in a boardroom for a very long time. That doesn't mean, Marin, you have to invite me into Luton Town, by the way, because I haven't been there yet. Um, but um, in that, it is such an exception. Um, so it, it isn't a great way of, of football operating and it really does need to change. And we really do need to look at who, after all, football clubs are role models, right? Owners of football clubs are role models. So we need to be making sure that we get the right owners in. Uh, and I, I would advocate quite heavily for that, that owners and directors test need to include an ethics element to it. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about what are these people like? Have they got history of hate crimes? Have they got history, you know, in all sorts of dodgy places, the human rights element? That's not really part of an owners and directors test at the moment. It's purely financial. And there is so much more to being a role model than just finance. Thanks for that. So we've got a couple of a couple of minutes left. So just I'll put it out to the the, the three speakers. Just any final um, remarks before we we, we close uh, the, what's been a really um, useful conversation and a really good discussion, I think. Just I'll put it out. So any other comments? Don't, I don't see anything, so I'll um I'll I'll I'll, I'll um close the, the meeting there. So I just want to say thank you all for for joining us today. Uh, do make sure you, you email or, or tweet or X as it's known now if you're if you enjoy it. And um, I want to say a huge thanks again to to Ali, Marianne, and Niall for for joining us. It's been a really a uh, really useful uh, conversation, a great discussion. Um and and just finally, uh, just remember that the team at the Co-op Party HQ are here to support all our members. Uh, so do reach out if you'd like more information or advice um, on anything. Um, any additional uh, questions? I've taken the ones from the the chat and the names that they're um, attached to. So we'll endeavour to send them over to 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 the speakers and get any responses um, over to, to yourself so we can uh, like see if there's any further questions if you email uh, the, the events team um, at, at the, at the co-op party we'll again endeavour to send them over to the speakers but yeah thanks again to everyone who's joined us this evening um, and I really look forward to, to seeing you all um, at the next one I think it's been a really good good discussion and sets us, our minds right for, for the, the, the battle ahead in terms of the, the regulator um, and what our priorities should be but thank you very much everybody